Hello and good evening to everyone. I'd like to wish you all a very happy and a joyful 2024. I hope that you've had a chance to rest and recuperate as we move into what I suspect is going to be a very, very challenging year. So it may seem strange that I'm speaking on New Year's Day, but it is because there is so much work to be done and there is so much that needs to be addressed. There is no time at the moment for any moment to go past. And so within that framework, I realized that I have to speak about a very important paper that I had seen some months before, but I had to sit on it and reflect about it um, to see what the relevance was from my point of view. Uh, this highlight today captured my attention about the COVID scientists um, warning about a new variant could cause a global heart failure pandemic. So I'll be covering that as well. I'll be making reference as well to the paper itself. And this is here assessment of myocardial FDG uptake in PET scans in asymptomatic patients. That's really the central bit. Um, but before I do that, I'd like to take the opportunity to remind everyone that um, I am having another webinar coming up. Uh, this is on Thursday, the 11th of, um, of January, looking at vaccine-induced abnormal heart physiology potential mechanisms. So it's similar to what I'm talking about today. But in truth, I can't necessarily go into all the details at this time um, because I need to be able to speak in an environment where it is open and free. And you can see here that I've come up with a draft agenda already looking at the normal heart function, substrate changes, um, PET scan, more detail, look at the paper, why we need autopsies and what the longer term implications are for the heart. That's a draft agenda, so it is due to change. So if you want to see this for free, um, you just have to register at the link below. Always happy to accept donations, but this will become a course afterwards, and so it will be paid. So I'm happy if you want to see it for free and uh, give me your comments at that time. So <clears throat> let's get back to the main point the abnormal physiology in the vaccinated heart. This is so important. As I said, I had to sit on this paper because it was so important. I really had to think about what it meant. What I think I am annoyed about, and this is why I'm talking about it today, is the headline here. And this headline here, this is from GB News. As I said here, COVID scientists issue a warning new variant could cause global heart failure pandemic. And so this was actually done, published on the 29th of December, 2023. And so they're concerned that there's a new strain of COVID which could potentially cause heart issues. And they're looking at this JN1, which Gert and I were talking about re recently, global healthcare risks related to COVID-19. And so that caught my attention, and I, I really, I don't like it when people try and hide the reality, especially in an environment where we need to understand stuff. This is not a time for politics, and this is the impression I got from this headline. This is about politics. I'll take you back to the article, which is in the uh, description here, and you can see down here, Japan's top research institute, uh, the Riken, has now issued a warning in the new report, which states that ACE2 receptors have always talked about ACE2 autoimmunity in severe COVID-19, uh, which the current coronavirus clings to within the human cells is very common in the heart. And this means many people who catch the virus may suffer from reduced cardiac function. Now, it's not that that is completely untrue. But it is not the main issue. It is only a part of the issue. And we have a much more serious issue going on in the background, which really, really needs to be addressed. Now, sadly, as I said, there is no pleasure in saying that I predicted this in March of 2023. The link is there if you want to see the link in the description to this video. 
heart failure epidemic. It has over 280,000 views. I predicted that in March 2023. I knew it was going to happen because the science connected. Now, the problem is, is that because there was no acknowledgement of the science at that point, it now means that the heart failure epidemic is now starting to appear, and suddenly they're coming up with reasons that are related to JN1. Now, JN1 will be a contributor, but it's not going to be the primary mechanism as to what is going on. So this leads us now to uh, the paper that I wanted to make reference to. Now, again, I can't go into too much detail, so there are only a, a few points that I am highlighting. And if you want to hear me go into more detail on it, please register for the webinar at the link below. So essentially, this paper here is about the assessment of myocardial FDG uptake at PET scans in asymptomatic SARS-CoV-2 vaccinated and non-vaccinated patients. And this is proper science, meaning that they just asked a question, really. That, that's what those researchers were doing. They were just asking a questions and reflecting on the outcomes of what they were seeing. And it's just simply because they had the opportunity to do this research. They're already doing PET scans on patients. And so the background, that is, this is a Japanese study, and you, you can see it, um, see it here. This is the, um, the full study here. So it's a Japanese study, uh, a radiological study, because they're already doing this work. And so they knew that patients who develop uh, myocarditis or after SARS-CoV-2 vaccination show abnormalities on cardiac MRI scans. So what they were interested in is whether or not some of those changes occur in asymptomatic patients who were vaccinated. Now, that is a perfect scientific question. That's the kind of question that we should have been asking very, very early on. Once there started to be evidence of issues around myocarditis, because myocarditis, inflammation of the heart muscle, doesn't necessarily present with symptoms. Subclinical myocarditis can be very, um, very nonspecific, very difficult to identify. And so when we spoke about people who had myocarditis, that was overt clinical myocarditis. What happens to the cohort who had much more subtle symptoms? Are they affected and what percentage? So this is what this was looking at. So this study here, bring this back up again. So this is, again, as I said, I'm doing a quick summary of it. And if you want to see the full analysis, you have to join on the webinar. But what they were doing is that they wanted to uh, assess the uh, fluorodeoxyglucose uptake on PET scans in asymptomatic patients vaccinated against SARS-CoV-2. And just so that you understand, a PET scan, a very important test, we usually use it primarily for cancer, and that's what they were using it for in those cases. But all they do is they take a glucose, and it's fluorodeoxyglucose, which is labeled. It has a specific mark on it. You can imagine it as a light, um, and that's what emits the, the nuclear, the positrons, so that it can be picked up in a scan. The reason it's important in cancer is simple. When you inject it into the bloodstream, and it's then injected just before the scan, areas that use a lot of glucose will concentrate this marker in them. And so if there is cancer, uh, cancer cells tend to use high levels of glucose because they don't tend to use the mitochondria. And so you will find that if there is a cancer, it can light up with a PET scan. So it's a perfectly valuable, important kind of test. And so all they did is that they were just reflecting on the fact that we're doing this test anyway. Why don't we look at the cohort of people who are unvaccinated and vaccinated and see what happens? What were the outcomes? So that's essentially all they did. They took 300 non-vaccinated patients, okay, average age of 52.9 years, and 700 vaccinated patients, average age of 56.8 years, 
and then they looked at the outcomes from the scans. So it was a retrospective study, meaning that they had already done this investigation and they were just looking back afterwards to say, okay, well, we've got this information here. Let's see if we can differentiate between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated in terms of what happens with the heart. I'm telling you, this is this is science. This is what we should be doing all the time. It's trying to understand what are the implications longer term of vaccination. Why would you not want to know? And I tell you, you know, this this is the the mistake that is happening in the scientific community. There is too much politics to not ask these really simple yet critical questions. So essentially, what they found, and again, I'll be covering this in more detail in the webinar, but essentially what they found when compared with non-vaccinated patients, okay, so it's non-vaccinated versus vaccinated, asymptomatic patients, so none of them had myocarditis or my, any symptoms, after their second dose, up to 180 days, they showed increased myocardial um, FDG uptake, this is the um, labeled glucose on the PET scans. And, and uh, it's difficult to go into all the details here now, but I'm just giving you a, a snippet of why this is so, so important. So it's all down to cardiac physiology. And this is why I said I took some time to reflect very carefully on what this meant. So it was published in September. A, a lot of people spoke about it, but I had to sit down and really reflect. What does it mean that there is increased glucose uptake? Now, some people may say, well, it doesn't matter too much, but this is 180 days afterwards, they are finding that significant rise in glucose uptake. Well, that's not bad. What's the problem with glucose? Okay, this is the bit that we'll go into in much more detail in the webinar, but I'll give you a taste, a snippet of it here. When we talk about heart muscle, heart muscle primarily uses free fatty acids or fat. 60 to 90% of its usage is that. Compared to carbohydrates, which is glucose, 10 to 40%. So there is a, a bit of an overlap where you can have more carbohydrate usage. But the primary energy source for the heart is fat. And there is an important reason for that. And this is why I said that understanding the implications of what we're seeing is really, really important. All I'll show you at the moment is an energy comparison so that you can grasp the significance of it. This is where we compare the kilojoules per gram that are produced between one gram of fat versus carbohydrate versus protein. So you have it here labeled A, B, and C. This is fat. This is carbohydrate. This is protein. For free fatty acids or fat, because it's broken down completely in mitochondria, one gram produces 37 kilojoules compared to 16 with carbohydrates and 17 with protein. So when it comes to function of both brain and heart, this is by far the most efficient use of energy, free fatty acids, because it produces the most bang per buck. So when you reflect on the fact that you are seeing a transition where more carbohydrate is being used, it effectively means there is less energy for the heart. It's as simple as that. And so in the average person, you may not notice any difference because you're not stressing your heart. But in the context of someone who is putting their heart under stress, this could be very, very significant. And here is an image from the paper as to what they were showing. As you can see here, is that in terms of the uptake, wherever there is high uptake, it goes very dark. So this is the brain. This is a 43-year-old male who is not vaccinated. And this here is an 80-year-old male who is not vaccinated. High uptake in the brain. You can see down here, this here is the liver. This is the heart. This is the spleen. Down here are the kidneys. So you can see the kidneys are lighting up a little bit brighter. 
but the liver, spleen, and heart don't really light up that much. And you can see the same here in the unvaccinated male who is 80 year old. Again, notice the heart. But when they looked at the vaccinated cohort, you can see this dark um, area here, which suggests high uptake of the glucose in both of them, in the 38-year-old and the 72-year-old. This one is less than the 38-year-old. But what I'm telling you is in the context of what I am saying about energy utilization, it therefore means that this heart cannot have the same degree of capability because of energy usage as this one. That's just the numbers, as simple as. The implications of it and the reason it occurs is really what I'm trying to understand. Why is it occurring? What is the mechanism? That's what I'll be trying to detail in the webinar. There are a number of options as to why it would occur. What are the longer term implications? Because as I said, if you're not stressing your heart, you may not notice that you have a limit to its capacity. But I'd be very interested in observing or finding out what happens to those people who are the high performance athletes, the ones who are pushing their bodies to the absolute limit. Are they able to reach the same level that they had before they were vaccinated? That's really the question. And so in order to understand how this works, and the reality is that we don't know if this means any major issue long term. We don't. But to ignore it is completely unacceptable. We have to understand it. We need to ask the questions. And so therefore, when we see news stories coming up and saying JN1 is going to be the reason for a heart failure epidemic, it may contribute to it because we know that infection can also damage the heart. And when you have the combination of the two things, where you have a damaged heart and then a heart that's damaged again by infection, absolutely, you will accelerate the process. But critically, as always, as I say, there is no way forward if we don't address the elephant in the room. And I do like us to reflect on it. That elephant is knocking stuff over. It's making an impact. It's not the only thing that's knocking things over in the room, but it's the biggest thing that needs to be addressed. I think that at this point in the year, I think this is the year where we need to have what we call hard talks, frank talks, open talks, looking at the implications longer term. I hope that we will find answers because the implications are serious. So for those who are interested, please, Join me at uh, the webinar uh, in the next week and a half. I'm happy to have you there. And uh, it's free. As I said, beyond that, it will be a course. So you'd have to pay for it. And just remember, there is still a lot of work to do in the year to come. This is a time for us to try and find solutions to mitigate what could be an absolutely frightening time for the rest of 2024. That's not ideally what I'd like my message to be at the start of the year, but there's no point in us not reflecting on the reality and the truth. So have a great evening, everyone. We will continue to look at the science and ask the hard questions. Thank you.